Welcome everybody again to Anchor of Hope. Thank you again for giving us this precious Saturday morning. Um, we really hope, and we hope this every time we have Anchor of Hope, that this time is a valuable time, um, not only expanding our psychological knowledge on today's topic, but ultimately our goal is to integrate that knowledge with what the gospel says about it as well. And so um, today's topic that we're going to be talking about is on the topic of depression. So um, we were talking about this before, you know, we allowed everyone in, but we know for sure depression is something that maybe you personally are struggling with, have struggled with, or maybe you have someone that you love in your life that you know who is struggling with depression or has. And so um, we know today will be a value, value, valuable, valuable time. So we're so glad you're here. Without further ado, I wanted to introduce um, today's presenter. We are welcoming back Dr. Esther Park, a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. Um, been in practice for many, many years. She's an awesome, awesome clinician, but an even amazing, more amazing believer. <laughs> so thank you for joining us again today, Dr. Esther. Um, but before I give the, the floor to Dr. Esther, I always like to open us up with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you so much. Um, you know, with everything that's going on in this world, um, it's honestly very, very disheartening. Um, and it's so easy for us to get swept up in all the tragedies and everything that's going on. But Father, today, we want to hold on to your hope um, when we join together for Anchor of Hope. We want to leave today feeling hopeful, feeling that there is room for healing, um, that ultimately you are still gracious, you are still loving, um, and that ultimately you are so sovereign. And we want to walk away from today um, really holding on to that hope. So Father, would you fill us with your spirit today? Fill us so that we can hear your voice and believe and enjoy and, and be empowered um, by today's Anchor of Hope. So thank you for bringing us all together today. And um, we lift this time up to you. In your name we pray, amen. All righty, Dr. Esther, take it away. Thank you. Um, I'll be sharing um, some slides, but thank you for joining again. This is a, a really important topic. It is probably just one of the main emotional struggles that we psychiatrists, psychologists, and therapists uh, deal with and help our, our clients. And many of us struggle with it, you know, on our own as well. Um, I'm just so amazed that it's only growing. <laughs> Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic, um, I learned yesterday marked the actual second year of, of, of how, when it really started and was announced that it was a pandemic. So yesterday was year two, end of year two, and we're kind of still in it. And it surfaced many more people with new diagnoses and those who were stable in the past uh, becoming depressed again and having additional episodes. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on uh, some of the um, the aspects of it, and then go right into the spiritual understanding uh, about depression. So I'm going to share my screen. So let's do a little quiz on a Saturday morning here. What is the most common illness in the U.S.? Is it cancer, AIDS, diabetes, or depression? You guessed it. It's depression, but guess what? Depression is more common than all of the above combined. It is way more rights, widespread than people are recognizing. And we have to kind of know and differentiate that there's a difference between regular sadness, not that sadness should be regular, um, or versus clinical level of depression, a depression that truly impairs function. And it's the leading cause of disability in ages 18 to 44. This is like prime working career ages, right? It affects almost 15, maybe even more now, because this is an older statistic, adults in a given year. And in the age group of 25 to 34, it's more common than homicide as a cause of death. It's so serious of a disorder 
and not paid attention to. But regarding suicide, countries such as Korea and Japan and these Asian countries, there's an alarming high rate of suicide. And even celebrities are taking their lives. And locally here in California, we've learned more and more church pastors themselves are also um, taking their lives. Truly alarming. So why do people suffer from depression during their young to mid adulthood? Or even though we know that clinical depression can occur during childhood or post-retirement ages, it's in all age groups, really. One big contributor um, as a, a trigger or, or exacerbation is stress and life changes, such as major losses. A major loss is like anything that you lose, right? Like um, a family member to death or a divorce or a job or a broken family or moving from place to place. Um, people of Ukraine right now, it's like they're losing their country. Um, so, so many of these kind of uh, major losses uh, can trigger a depressive episode. Biological and genetic factors. They're there, we cannot deny it. Limited resources for support, it starts to add to that stress and negative coping skills. So why don't people seek help if this is so common? Well, the stigma is still around, right guys? I, this is why Oak Hill Foundation has been established to try to reduce the stigma and, and help people realize that it's an illness and it's, it's a condition uh, that can be helped and should be helped. Some people don't know that they actually need help. You know, how do I know I, I have this? Some people who have come to um, my, our clinic, when I meet them, they're like, I didn't even know this was something treatable. I didn't know this was, I thought it was just me all my life, you know, like, and that's just me. And sometimes it's hard to start. Effort, it takes effort, it takes money, it takes energy, it takes time. Sometimes people who are severely depressed, they don't have energy to even wash themselves, right? And it's very difficult to get up, let alone make that phone call and, and start calling around to find that help. Major depressive disorder, the good news is it's treatable. It's a treatable illness. And we have to treat it because it impairs away someone thinks, feels, behaves, and functions. And because it's treatable, I think that's why I went into psychiatry and, and into this career. Health professionals call it major depression if you have at least five of these symptoms for at least two weeks. So this is a list of the criteria um, that we look for. And if anyone has a combination of these, should start thinking, you know, am I struggling with clinical depression? Feeling sad, not enjoying things that you used to, feeling excessively guilty, worthless, fatigue, energy loss, concentration issues, sleeping too much, too little, appetite or weight changes, feeling restless or irritable, and especially thoughts of suicide or death. That is not normal. That is not supposed to be around. So yeah, five, at least five of these, or just at least four or five, it, we usually just share with our clients, um, hey, let's approach this, let's, let's, let's uh, address it. People with major depression might also have other physical symptoms. And that's why they don't think it's an emotional disorder. Pain or other illnesses that get worse, stomach aches, headaches, digestive problems. So these days, a lot of medical professionals, like non-psychiatry medical professionals, internal medicine, surgery, OBGYN, they are more and more trained now to realize what they're dealing with is not an actual physiological like organ issue of what they're a specialist for. Um, but they're like, oh, I think this is a referral to psychiatry. And they, they have to be very, very uh, strategic and gentle and sharing that with their patient. No, you don't have anything wrong with your stomach. Your stomach actually is fine, 
but it might be something else like depression or anxiety. This is a slide, even though it's very cute, <laughs> it's a serious business of trying to see what treatments are out there and look out. When we say treatment, a lot of people think, oh, Dr. Esther, you just want to give me meds, right? Not necessarily. It's part of the treatment plan and program, but we have to address all of these issues as you see here. If there are physical health problems, we need to address that. If there's poor nutrition, we need to address that. If there is a hormonal imbalance, we have to help that, right? Definitely drugs, alcohol, any substance that is not really meant naturally to be in our bodies, that can definitely help, I mean, definitely contribute to depression symptoms. Sometimes alcohol in and of itself is causing the depression. Um, so we have to address all of these areas. And of course, the psychological piece addressing stress, processing trauma, um, and any other interpersonal relationship struggles. And this, this picture is not all conclusive. There are many more new psych, um, depression treatments that are coming out. TMS has been around, transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, VNS, and ECT. I don't have time to spell out all of the acronyms, but, and then there's so many psychological um, treatments as well. CBT, DBT, IPT, <laughs> right? So I'll spare you uh, of, of that one for another lecture. So how does the Bible explain this suffering? I want to introduce you to this concentric diagram. Um, in the middle, you'll see that there's a spirit, um, the middle circle, mind, heart, and outer circle body. This is nowhere anything anatomical, okay? Just wanted to show how we are made of multiple aspects all at once. So I call this diagram like the biopsychosocial spiritual explanation um, because we're not one dimensional, right? We cannot reduce the explanation of emotional struggles to only one aspect or another. For example, there can be a weakness just in our physical or bodily area. Um, there can be an emotional or, un, or relational unhealth affecting our mind and heart. But we also have a spirit. And there are some people who don't believe we have a spirit, but we do. This inner deep spirit level that can feel as if it's crushed. All three of these aspects have a role in developing depression. All three areas are affected by depression, right? So these are um, interrelated. So let's gain a little bit more spiritual understanding. Earlier, I mentioned about how depression can be triggered or result from a major loss. On a spiritual level, I want to explain that this major loss is loss of God's spirit, of wholeness, and all good things. So the suffering comes from an absence of God's spirit, Romans 3, a loss of wholeness, or what they call shalom, a completeness, Ephesians 2, and a lack of goodness. That original Genesis 1 paradise has been lost. So how did that happen? God created man to be with him, with no unmet needs, fully happy and at peace. But this enemy named Satan deceived man to disbelieve God's word, to stop believing in God. And the original sin entered into man causing spiritual death and all the curses in life, such as depression and anxiety. This is the spiritual root problem that cannot be solved with human effort. However, good news is God provided a way. He demonstrated his love for us by Jesus dying for us while we were yet sinners. Romans 5.8, Jesus is the Christ who completed the work of the prophet, of the priest, and king, bridging me to God, 
removing the sin and destroying Satan's captivity. If I believe and only believe and receive this gift, I become a child of God. And now God is with me in me. And I have the right to experience all the blessings intended for me. So fundamentally, separation from God is the ultimate problem. This God-sized void can only be filled by God himself. But even after Jesus enters your heart, you become a child of God, you become a Christian or, you know, believing in God, and you are with him and he's with you, there can still be a painful slowness in resolving depression symptoms. There's this like myth that once God enters your life and Jesus is your savior, that you shouldn't be depressed or you can't have major depression. And that's not true. Christians, non-Christians alike, young and old, can get attacked and affected by this illness. That could be quite discouraging. Did you know that there were several people during biblical times who may have suffered from a despondent spirit? Job, King David, Prophet Elijah, Jeremiah, just to name a few, they were all depressed. They had despondency. But I want to kind of analyze what did they believe in? What truth did they know that they may have held on to during those times of despondency? Well, one I know is this. They knew that they were fighting a bigger enemy, bigger than depression. Oh my gosh, there's a bigger enemy than depression. His name is Satan, who still works to this day. And he has these goals. The more we learn about this enemy, the more we can fight. For the one, for the person who has not met God yet, Satan's goal is don't meet him. <laughs> don't be saved. Don't become a child of God. Satan's other goal for the one who does believe for the one who already met God, who is a child of God already, what is his goal? Is for this person to remain troubled in spirit and not know and not enjoy the blessings of being a child of God. These Bible people, what other truth did they hold on to? I think they held on to an inexplicable, indestructible hope because of Jesus. Because even in the circumstances of their life they knew who he was and what he has done and what he will do for them christ jesus himself was also broken in his spirit and body jesus experienced deep emotional and spiritual sorrow as well especially in the garden of gethsemane knowing that on that cross he's going to be broken and separated he would experience the absence of God's spirit, the loss of wholeness, and have lack of goodness as he took up the weight of the sin of the world upon himself and he died. However, he rose again. These Bible time believers, they had unshakable hope knowing this and concluded that their pain will not end in vain. One more truth I think they held on to is they knew they were not alone. Although everyone else around them may not understand, and that's something I hear very often, no one else understands me, but Jesus surely does and is, was always with them and always will be with us. Now, depression, it oftentimes leads to these. Hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness. One or the other or all three many times. But remember, I was talking about that spiritual fight. What is that fight against? It's against this enemy who tempts and deceives the mind to disbelieve God's promises. He will continue fanning the flame of cognitive distortions, incorrect thoughts that would lead to even deeper despair. He likes to poke at that scar and that pain constantly. And that number one lie that he uses, 
the poking stick that he keeps using to poke at us is God doesn't love you. He doesn't care. You're not worthy of love. That is his lie. So then what do we do? How do we address this clinical depression, this problem? Well, while we address and we should address the biological and the psychological needs, my encouragement is to hear and learn, comprehend, believe who Jesus is and what he has done. Somebody may think that the spiritual application of depression is read the Bible more, go to church more, pray more, fast more, give to the needy more, give thanks more, forgive more. You know, with human effort, we cannot do that. That's just trying to place a bomb on top of something we must remove. So knowing who Jesus is, knowing that person of Jesus, this is the only way to penetrate and heal this inner spirit level. Now, God loves you unconditionally, regardless of how you feel and how far along you are in life, how much you do or don't do. This love of God, I think people hear it all the time, right? It's just a cliche for all of these years. God loves you. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. But many people say, I, I know. Okay, I know. But we don't really know. Like, we don't really, really know what this love of God is really like. Right? And God is with you. That's a very common phrase to the whole world, whether they believe in God or not. You know, they hear it all the time. What does that really mean? Right? The way to fight some of these emotional struggles is thought, right? To understand and to think. Romans 8.38 it says this, for I am convinced, look at that word, convinced, thought, no conviction, right? That not feel, which is waxing and waning and always changing, knowing, convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present time nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else, neither depression, anxiety, anything else, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I talked about know, right? Know and experience that Jesus is your Christ to know and confirm that your identity is the beloved child of God. And I keep saying no, K-N-O-W, <laughs> no, because it's like the key aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's one of the main um, modalities that we use in, in psychotherapy. Not just stop feeling sad. You shouldn't be so sad. It's what are your thoughts? What are your beliefs? On the spiritual level, know that you're a beloved child of God. And then you can witness the melting of hopelessness. Colossians 1.27. Know you are a child of God and you're beloved by him. And you can unshackle from helplessness. Romans 8. Know and believe that you're a child of God. Then you'll be able to eradicate all opinions of worthlessness. Deuteronomy 33. Because of Christ, you are no longer broken. You feel it, okay, you feel it, but you're no longer broken. You need to know that you're no longer broken and that your identity is God's beloved. Your identity is not, I am depressed. No, I am a child of God. I happen to have some depression and experience some sadness and have all of these symptoms of a major depressive episode. Despite that, I am God's beloved. And Christ's love for you can slice through any thickness of depressions, darkness, and desolation. The question is, not will he do it? Do I believe this? Do I find it even a little bit believable? So lastly, again, my encouragement is treat the physical, right? Treat the physical issues. If you have a serotonergic issue, 
just please treat it. You know, take those meds. If you have cognitive and emotional issues, just go to psychotherapy. That's what they get paid for. Why do it on your own? You can't revive and nourish the spirit. You know, the first step is if you haven't already, you have to personally meet God and become a child of God. If you're not sure that you're, you've met him or not, or you're not sure if you're a child of God, then let's be sure. You can message us, email us, and we'll help you be sure. And it won't take very long, actually, to be sure, I promise. And as you enjoy the relationship with him, you can experience the power to improve all the aspects of life, spirit, mind, heart, body. And remember, you cannot do this alone. You know, as you need a team for surgery, like let's say that you have to get a tumor out of your system and you're on the operating table, you're not gonna cut yourself open and pull that out on your own, right? The surgeon has to be there, the anesthesiologist has to be there, the OR nurse has to be there, the receiving nurse of the step-down unit have to be there, right? It's a whole team to treat this. You need a community, you need family, you need friends, maybe you need fully health, you need Oak Hill Foundation, you need each other. We all need each other to address this. Let me pray for us. God, we approach this topic in just a few slides on depression. And I don't know if I did any justice in regards to explaining the spiritual aspect and the spiritual approach of how Jesus can be the answer to depression. I just pray, Lord, those who are here or anyone who will be listening afterwards on the recordings, if they themselves are experiencing depression or know someone else experiencing depression, that miraculously you will do your divine intervention and in letting them know how much you love them, how much, Jesus, you were willing to be broken and have the absence of God's spirit and lost all goodness when you went to the cross for our sin so that we can be with you forever. I pray, Lord, that you will do that intervention and remind us all in our sad moments, in our difficult moments, that you are always with us. In Jesus' name we pray.